Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Before we get started with today's teaching, a couple of reminders. To stay connected to this channel for future teachings, click the subscribe button on the screen. If you found value in this program, please give us a thumbs up. Also, if you scroll down to the description box below, that's where you'll find the links to all of my social media sites, as well as the link to my blog, My Daily Letters where I post the prophetic words I receive from the Lord. Now that all of that is out of the way, let's get started with today's teaching entitled, The Prophet's Calling. The Lord asked me to share with you today about the prophetic and the ministry of a prophet. For many throughout the centuries, a prophet's role was thought to center on the foretelling of future events. But when we dig deeper, we actually find a multifaceted ministry. So to begin, let's define what a prophet is. In Jeremiah 1.5, a familiar verse for many of us, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. This is where the Lord affirms Jeremiah's calling. Notice the word before. Before the Lord had formed Jeremiah in the womb, meaning in eternity's past, God himself had already placed this prophetic mantle on Jeremiah's shoulders. So then prophet is not a gifting you can just decide to possess. It is something that you are, a divine appointment made by God himself. A prophet is called to express the thoughts and aspects of God's very nature through who he or she is, meaning the identity of the prophet is integral to his ministry and is not defined by a job or a title. Let me further explain. If we examine the prophets and their ministry from the Old Testament, what we will find is that each prophet expressed through their ministry a divine truth. For instance, in Hosea, the truth embodied is reconciliation. Like a husband who takes back a cheating wife, God repeatedly took Israel back. The life of Hosea bears this truth out because, as some of you may not know, the Lord asked Hosea to marry a harlot who, during their marriage, repeatedly prostituted herself. Instead of divorcing her, which was his right, the Lord instructed Hosea to reconcile with her, just as the Lord did with Israel, who continued to follow after false gods. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in steadfast love, and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Another prophetic trait is seen in the Old Testament, where the Lord would raise up a prophet to be his mouthpiece during times of national rebellion. The prophet would stand in the midst of the people and proclaim the word of the Lord, restating again God's intentions towards his people in an effort to bring them back into alignment with his will. We see this in Jeremiah 25. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, Although the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants, the prophets, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers from of old and forever. God not only sent Jeremiah, but other prophets as well, with words of redirection, urging God's people to turn back to the Lord. But they continue to close their ears to God's word, and as Jeremiah later predicts, entered 70 years of Babylonian captivity. This was the judgment rendered for their disobedience and refusal to listen to God's words uttered through his prophets. A third facet of the prophet is their internal disposition to affirm the line of holiness drawn without yielding, even when there is mounting outside pressure to compromise or rather make concessions with evil. T. Austin Sparks offers a good illustration 
of this prophetic function. The prophet stood in the midst of the stream, usually a fast rushing stream, like a rock. The course of things broke over them. They challenged and resisted that course, and their presence in the midst of the stream represented God's mind as against the prevailing course of things. Well, now that we've seen a glimpse of what a prophet is, let's dive a little deeper into the ministry of the prophet. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus himself established the fivefold ministry, which includes the office of the prophet. We see this in Ephesians 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The Lord highlighted the terms equip and build up. Equipping or perfecting in the Greek implies correcting in all that is inadequate, instructing so as to put right. The basic idea is putting someone or something into the correct condition making them fully prepared for what lies ahead. Building up, or edification in this sense, is about increasing the number of believers and then advancing their spiritual growth and maturity as servants of Christ. Equipping then comes through a, a spiritual preparation process, but building speaks to the nature of the work of ministry. So then each believer is equipped to operate as a builder building up the kingdom of God. Just like in the physical sense when a person is hired to start a new job, training comes first. The owner has specific members of his management team set aside to teach and instruct new employees how to do their job well, so that they are an asset to the company. In the spiritual sense, this is what prophets do as instruments for preparing believers to serve the higher purposes of God, equipping them to walk in the fullness of who they were created to be. This is done through teaching and training with words of direction, correction, warning, and encouragement. All of these functioning as modes of divine expression where God's thoughts can be made fully known to his people in order to not only strengthen their faith, but advance the expansion of God's kingdom here on earth. And as I shared in one of my previous teachings, in 2017, the Lord expanded my prophetic calling. Up until that time, I would on occasion receive a short, simple word during Sunday morning services. But then one evening while sitting with him, that all changed. I began receiving what he calls letters virtually every day, a manner of operating in the prophetic that's continued that way ever since. While preparing for this teaching, the Lord brought to mind the prophetic progression of these words. At first he spoke about my future, but then his words brought insight into his personality or perspective on a specific topic of interest. On occasion, Jesus would show up and speak to me. One day as I sat with him, I began to write poetry, which for me personally is a foreign form of expression. As time progressed, the Lord added words about the nation, politics, the church, even about goings on in the world. Oftentimes while addressing current events, he would include direction on how we as believers should pray. Some of these words were corrective in nature, others were meant to encourage, Words of judgment came as well. The words he gave me were at times allegorical, sometimes whimsical, sometimes filled with his passion. They ran the full scope of prophetic expression. What he showed me the other day was that the past six years have been for me a real-time classroom lesson about how the prophetic operates by expressing his thoughts in multiple forms. Now, if you ask most people about prophecy, the majority will probably answer that it is predictive. 
that prophets basically tell about future events and occurrences, kind of like a soothsayer who tells someone's fortune. While it's true that some prophetic utterances are predictive, that is only one aspect of this ministry. A fuller understanding of prophetic function is spiritual interpretation, meaning the prophetic centers on interpreting God's thoughts and then expressing those thoughts to his people. So then prophecy defined in its simplest form is divine revelation flowing through the Lord's chosen oracles who then declare to the children of God, as did the prophet Isaiah, this is the way, walk in it. Something important to keep in mind is that a prophet is tasked with hearing the thoughts of an infinitely powerful mind and translating that to a finite-minded audience, which views those words through the lens of present-day culture and preconceived notions. Reading more into a prophetic word from either the prophet or the hearers can easily lead to misinterpretation. This principle is illustrated clearly in the recent past. As many prophets took criticism from all sides when during and since the 2020 presidential election, some, including yours truly, prophesied that Trump would win another term. When what was uttered did not manifest, the term false prophet was liberally tossed around. Now, I was puzzled about the turn of events as well, and when I asked the Lord what to do, he said, there shall be no retractions, stand on what you heard. While some did walk back the words they heard the Lord say, many stood firm. Did we hear wrong, or were there other forces at work? Since those days in 2020, I've discovered quite a bit more about how prophecy functions. The Lord brought into focus three elements of prophecy that are often overlooked. First, foreknowledge does not always mean predestination. Now, as I already stated, usually when we think prophecy, it falls into the category of predictive, which also includes predestination meaning that the Lord said it, so that means it is etched in stone and will at some point happen, period. Now, there are times when what is predicted does occur as said. For example, when Agabus the prophet in Acts 11 prophesied a severe famine was coming to Rome, historians later confirmed that event actually happened as predicted. However, consider some other things when dealing with prophecy. For instance, just because God foreknows something does not mean it will automatically come to pass or that it is predestined to happen, as free will often affects the outcome. As when David saves the city of Keilah in 1 Samuel 23, it says that David gets wind that the Philistines were coming against the people of Keilah and so he inquired twice of the Lord, first to see if he should go up and fight, then again to see if he would have the victory. The Lord tells David to go and that the Lord would ensure his victory. David goes and defeats the Philistines. But watch what happens next in this story. Saul hears that David is in Keilah, so he sets out in pursuit of him. When David finds out that Saul is coming, he inquired this of the Lord. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hands? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. God foresaw what was going to happen, but David's free will came into play and shifted the course of events to an alternate outcome. Did that mean what the Lord saw wasn't true? Not at all. God foreknew a possibility 
when he saw what lay ahead for David if he maintained his current heading. God knows the choices we're going to make long before we come to that crossroad, but he does not force us to go one direction or the other. He allows us to decide which path we will take. However, we still need to inquire of the Lord as did David, because what we choose to do is important to how things will turn out. So then the next element to consider is this. Partnership is key. The free will attribute which God designed into creation can have a direct effect on the foreknowledge aspect of the prophetic word, as in the case of the Trump prophecies. In some of those prophecies, mine included, the Lord stated his will and then gave specific directions for partnership to see the fulfillment of those words. Let me explain. Knowing that our relationship with the Lord flows through partnership, our free will is meant to operate in conjunction with God's will, even if we aren't too keen about what the Lord has said. Because mankind is governed by the law of free will, we can choose to reject God's authority and opt for our own instead. This is illustrated with David's son, Adonijah, who decided he would be king instead of Solomon. After receiving support from a few important figures in Israel, he sets himself up as king, even though Nathan the prophet in 1 Chronicles 17 had already prophesied that David's son, who was destined to build the Lord's house, would be king. As we clearly see in other verses, he was speaking of Solomon. Nathan was not in error when he prophesied. It was Adonijah's free will which diverted for a short time the prophetic fulfillment. The last element is discernment, not accuracy, is often the real issue. What I mean is this. Prophecy is, as we know in the general sense, spiritual interpretation and then expression of the thoughts God wants to share with his creation. A prophet may have accurately heard what the Lord said, but failed to rightly discern God's actual meaning behind what was heard. As God oftentimes is intentionally vague or ambiguous in the way he expresses his thoughts, much like Jesus speaking to the masses in parables. In order to encourage the hearer to press in deeper to uncover his intended meaning. A case in point concerns a prophet who predicted the death of an important political figure by the midterm elections. Because the prophet took the word death literally and ran with it, and since that political figure did not die as predicted would happen, the prophet's reputation has now been called into question. What the Lord appears to have meant was the death of influence, which is borne out by the passage of time as this politician's influence has severely waned. It wasn't necessarily that the prophet heard wrong initially, but that the discernment of what was heard was off. If the prophet or even the hearer leans on their own understanding when discerning God's words, unintended assumptions of what God meant can contaminate the prophetic word. Remember, none of us are perfect vessels, which means even prophets are going to stumble at times. In closing, none of what I've said here today is new revelation. Still, I do believe some of the ideas expressed have been lost in translation. Well, this is not an in-depth teaching on everything prophetic, hopefully, it has offered some deeper insights about prophetic ministry and its intended function in the body of Christ. Thanks again for joining me today.